Right, so uh, we have a panel talk now. So who have we got? Panelists, you can come up and see Susan there who's moderating it. The panel is entitled The Evolution of Game Economies. So um, as tends to happen in blockchain game conferences, we talk uh, quite a lot about sort of Axie Infinity um, and we sort of uh, rightly or wrongly portray the whole uh, blockchain game sector as, as Axie Infinity and that's had a lot of... Uh, interest and a lot of changes in its economy, so I'm sure that will be covered in the, in the panel, but there are economies and games beyond Axie Infinity, so I hope, hope you'll be covering those as well. Thanks for coming. My name is uh, Susan Cummings. I'm CEO of Tiny Rebel Games and Pediverse Network, and we have an awesome group of British guys, as the American woman here, <laughs> um, to talk to. And a Finnish guy. And a Finnish, right, yeah. Everyone else is British, is that right? Wow. Yeah. Oh, God. All right. I take that back entirely. Um, to talk to you about player economy and blockchain, and uh, I'm really excited that we're doing this. I think GDC doesn't have any discussions that I could see about blockchain, so I'm really excited that um, so much of that's going on here at Pocket Gamer. Could everyone do like a quick intro, like a 60 second, 90 second sort of who you are? Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Anton. I'm, from, I'm principal at Play Ventures. Uh, we're an early stage VC. Been up and running for the past three years, mostly investing in free to play. Uh, mobile studios, a bit on the PC side as well as as well as associated tech and infra uh, in, in the game industry. Um, I initially joined the firm in 2019 to focus on the first blockchain gaming investments. Uh, we only did one at the time, but now we have a dedicated fund called the Play Future Fund that is fully focused on investing into studios and 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 uh, tech providers within this budding space. And um, currently, I'm, I'm running that fund for Play Ventures, and I'm excited to to talk about this topic today. Awesome. Tony? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Tony. Um, I've been in the games industry now for 25 years. I go back Sega, Nintendo, PlayStation 1, mobile gaming, Facebook gaming, and then got into blockchain games back in 2017. Started a company called Reality Gaming Group. Looked at tokenizing in-game items for an augmented reality game we were doing before the word NFTs even existed just playing around with blockchain, really believed that this would be a game changer for players. And since then, we've built platforms. We launched NFT uh, games. We're doing one with Doctor Who. Um, we're about to announce a generative art drop with a very big brand. Um, we were doing something with Worms and Team 17 until a few weeks ago. And, and, uh, and I'm just so passionate about this whole industry. Hello everyone, I'm Jari Pana, I'm the CEO of uh, Supremacy Games from Finland. I've been in games and media for 25 plus years. I was once the editor-in-chief of official PlayStation Magazine and PC Gamer, until I saw the light and came to this side. Uh, for the last six, seven years I've been in mobile games and uh, recently working on blockchain games as well. And our idea for blockchain is that we're marrying it with well-known IPs, because we think that's where the business is heading. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ben Cousins. I, uh, I'm head of business development for Zebedee. Uh, we're a company that provides payments infrastructure using Bitcoin to video games. Uh, I've got a background in games development originally and then later in finance and VC. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlotte. I'm the CEO of Xmox. It's a Hamburg-based UA agency. And right now we don't do anything directly in, in, in the crypto space, but I used to work quite some time, like 10 years at Good Game Studios, is a well-known game developer based in Hamburg. And I'm personally in, in the crypto space since 2017, and I'm, I'm supporting advising a lot of projects. The recent one I'm supporting advising is uh, it's a company based in Holland, it's Cryptopolis. So yeah, quick intro. Thanks everyone. Um, so not knowing everyone who's in the audience, let's start by talking about what Play to Earn is and Axie and games like that. Um, talk to me about what it is and how it works and, and um, give a quick primer to people who are in the audience who might not be familiar. Tony, do you want to start or Jerry? Okay, um, I, I wasn't expecting this because I actually haven't played Axie Infinity, but uh, that's certainly one of the most famous uh, games uh, in the world because uh, of such a huge following. Uh, it's uh, it's a bit of like a Pokemon uh, in cryptocurrency. You buy three axes and then you breed them and then you battle with them and hopefully you earn something from them. There are uh, very good cases uh, when people in some of the poorer countries have earned a very good living and in some cases apparently 
drop their doctoral studies, uh, which I do not recommend. But <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if, well, if anyone has anything else to add to that, please. I think Plato and gaming is fundamentally about bi-directional value transfer. It's about the fact that money can come out of the game as much as it can go in. And I, I really think it's that simple. We hear a lot about Plato and, and Ben, I know you were in the investment community and Anton, you are. What else are you seeing? What other trends out there that aren't necessarily about play to earn? What other interesting use cases are you starting to see for blockchain from game developers? Um, so I, I think it's, um, if you look at play to earn, I think there's been a lot of, there's too much of this play to earn, play to mint, play to play and earn. There's, I think they all fall under the same umbrella of uh, utilizing utilizing on-chain elements uh, in your game economy, or basically not having, I mean, the games are still running on the comp company's own ser servers, et cetera, and I don't see that being decentralized in the, in the near or, or the medium term, uh, at least. Uh, but, um, but really kind of, I think we're still having quite of a micro look into what this actually enables. Currently, I mean, the first use is the first ways to interact with this is that we have we have NFT marketplaces, and it's, it's generally more um, more acceptable to to do trading between players of open game assets. I mean, that that not that, that is not inherently a new thing, but um, maybe the new thing here is that now there's a possibility of the, for these assets to be on the on the same canvas as all of the other assets as well, and they're more not interoperable in a sense that hopefully bringing I think. We all agree from in the game industry that it's 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 a bit of a meme when when people say that I will be bringing this sword from game one to game two. I mean, someone has to 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 render the the three three D model for the for the other game as well. But um, maybe the picture I'm, picture I'm trying to paint here is is sort of what happens when game econ when we build game economies in a way that they're built under the same canvas as all of the other financial products we're using as consumers across the board. So uh, maybe the wild picture I'm painting here over the next next five years is that if we have a health a typically uh, a typical game so, uh, the he healthy economy healthy player base good retention numbers people spend money on it people take money in in and out from the game uh, and let's say Axie would become a mass market game and a portfolio of Axies would be de facto a very liquid investment for you also also, also sorry also as an individual. Um, I don't think it's impossible that these people can, for example, utilize a lending protocol built on, on Ethereum and actually deposit those game assets and take out a loan, take out a mortgage, anything else. And I think that's where we kind of, kind of with the step function improvement in unlocking the value that is being created in games is, is going to happen. Tony, what do you think about this and interoperability generally in games? Well, uh, so. It's all about getting the players invested into the game. I mean, this is so different that the whole economy on blockchain games and NFTs is so different to free to play or any traditional game. And I think that's the, the, the learning curve and the difficulty and the education that I think developers need to go through before they just go, oh my God, it's killing the world. Don't do it. <laughs> you know, it, it's when you actually start to play these games and you enjoy the mechanics and get through the friction, which the, the, the guy before showed a fantastic slide of, of that friction, and make it easier. Once you're in and you're invested and you're inside that community, it's such fun. And, and the fact that you're, in theory, earning money to, to invest time and play is the way this whole market's going to go. But let's, let's talk about that. Gamers hate it, right? We, we, we've seen Ubisoft take a complete U-turn and no, Worms take a complete No, they turn. don't. No, gamers... The press and certain game developers and certain haters hate it. It's, it's back to education. It's back to understanding that the biggest negativity that comes out from the press is either it's killing the planet. Well, it's not. You know, NFTs aren't Bitcoins. NFTs, 99% of them now, are minted on a side chain. They use less energy than a Visa transaction. You know, they are not killing the planet. And, and People need to start, stop saying that. You know, it, it's just so irritating. And, and the, the press that came out from you know, Team 17 was, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. And 99% of the comments were completely wrong and, and, and misinformed and just, yeah, I mean, just, it, it, there's a big problem here. Kagler, what do you think in terms of how we 
how we get the gaming audience or even, or is it the audience we want yet? Are we trying to jump in too I quickly mean, to get to hardcore? I mean, this is exactly the question. Um, are these people who are joining a play to earn game, are these, are, are these people are gamers? Or are they just come to earn money? So I think this is the first question we have to answer. So, and right now, the most of the people, they are traders, you know, they are, they are in this space. They did a lot of ICOs, et cetera, and that's why they are the first ones who are minting the projects and then willing to make money out of it. And then some of these guys, they even don't mind if there's a game coming out or not. And then, of course, the next thing is like, okay, let's say the game is out on the Ethereum chain, right? I mean, the gas fees are so high. How are you going to balance it? Then it's going to be on-chain and off-chain. Which part is on-chain, which part is off-chain to make it at the end a blockchain game? If you do everything on-chain, the gas fees are going to be so high if you know the chosen blockchain um, project, the chain price is high, like the one from Ethereum, then it's, again, not affordable. Well, then don't use Ethereum. You know, go to Polygon or go to Solana or do it on a side chain. Yeah, of course. This is, this is where people are looking at at the moment. Polygon, like you said, it's quite cheap and it makes sense. But again, how deep are the pockets of these guys to finance a project, you know, the guys who are owning uh, Polygon? So it's like, it's a, it's a, it's, there are some questions that need to be answered until we can say where this will go. And, and beside that, I mean, friends of mine, they had a quite interesting project um, and it really went well. But the problem was uh, when they balanced the game, so they didn't consider giving out less power to the users. So the, some of the users became such whales that owned so much of the tokens so that they were telling them what to do in the game. If not, we will crush the price, we will kill the game. So it's uh, really hard to, um, you know, to balance such a game. I heard say. the other day that Axie is going to go free to play or allow people to, to get in for free to. Um, because of that, that high uh, threshold. Well, actually, it in. was quite funny on, on the Axie. So you need three characters to start playing Axie. And those characters are expensive now because their token went up. They're about $200 each. You need three of them. So that's $600 just to start playing. So there's now companies that are renting Axies out. So you literally buy them for a tenner and you pay um, I mean, this interest on Sorry, but this is exactly what I mean. People are there to earn money with this. So they are not there to play the game and enjoy the game. No, I, look, I, get, I totally get that. I mean, Axe is very heavy on the play to earn, um, not necessarily on the gameplay, but there are some incredible games coming through. And I think people learn, right? So people have, have you know, you ha when you're coming into a brand new market and you're inventing something new, there's always going to be difficulty. And you, and you learn from that and you build better. And, and I think in the next 12 months, you're going to see some really good gameplay that's well balanced. And that and balancing is an issue. And, and token economics is incredibly difficult. And you need to, you need to have mathematicians to, to work some of this stuff out. But there are companies that have that. And, yeah. and if they get it right, it's great fun. Well, let's talk about free to play, though, back in the day, which all of us were in the industry back then, back in the day last year. Um, and, and I'm sure we all remember back then how much everyone hated free to play. I remember the first GDC where Candy Crush showed up and it was like we, all the old timers were like, it's the end of our industry. Look at the Candy Crush people. And, and they'd taken over. And, um, and so it kind of feels a little bit reminiscent of that. What can we learn from how free to play ultimately got adopted by the masses in terms of what content you saw early on versus what content you saw later on? Ben? I think, I think the main thing is that free to play found a business model that worked and then it could scale. I think developers need to ask themselves, are they, are they gamifying cryptography or are they building a game? And those are very different things. Uh, and if your whole gamification is to try and solve the friction process of getting onto a crypto rail, you're not really building a game. You're focused on building a market and building a market is a very different thing. I don't think all games developers want to do that. I believe that um, why games players are reacting so negatively towards NFTs is because a lot of it is uh, quite manifestly and shamelessly a cash grab. That's not to paint everything all with one brush, but some of it quite clearly is. And it also borders on selling unlicensed securities to teenagers, effectively. Uh, and I did securities law, so I, I do know when something is a security and when something isn't. Um, I think what games developers need to think about is Take your game, it can be an existing game, uh, if it's well balanced, great, and think about where the value transfer needs to come in. 
And does that value transfer need to be inherent to the game itself, i.e. does the game need to be decentralized, i.e. built on a blockchain, whether or not that blockchain is decentralized, subject to debate, uh, or do they just want to have payments flowing through the game? I, re I really think the keep it simple stupid principle is something that a lot more games developers should think about. How about you, Jerry, what do you think? Uh, I have to say that I totally agree with Ben uh, on, on those things. Uh, I think we are on the verge of the, like a second wave of crypto games uh, where the major players are going to be uh, experienced game developers and we will see much better games than previously. And uh, also about uh, uh, the hate uh, from uh, some of the players like PC players, I, I think they might feel themselves as a little bit of threatened because I see comments like, uh, we don't want our games to be changed into crypto. Well, no, no one's doing this. So I, I believe that uh, there's PC and console gaming and mobile gaming and a third thing, which is crypto gaming or NFT gaming. And uh, they have a somewhat separate audiences, but uh, some people will play all of them like I do. Do, do you think that it's an, going back to my original question, is it an uphill battle that the game industry isn't ready for that we're trying to hit, to, hit the hardcore too quickly? I don't think it's uh, it's going to be a battle. I'm, I mean, this uh, this has already gone out. I, I guess so, I mean yeah. to say, in free to play, yeah. it took a long time to get to Call of Duty on mobile. We started with Candy Crush, then we got to Midcore, and eventually we got to Call of Duty. Yeah. I think um, when we talk about free to play, and as you said, like Candy Crush, it took quite some time yeah. to go to Call of Duty. I mean, the the main thing is, like all these um, casual games uh, with the very easy to enter and easy to play with the tutorials explaining everything that path the way uh, to games like Call of Duty. So people who were non-gamers, exactly, yeah. you know, they were gamers because it was so easy to become a gamer. You just open your app store, you download a game, there you go, now you're a gamer. But if you want to play like a play to earn game on the blockchain, good luck with it. You have to watch like, I don't know, several YouTube tutorials, try <laughs> error, you need to have you know, Polygon um, uh, coins or whatever, uh, Ethereum, to just enter, just to try out uh, the game. And then you have to buy the Anxi or whatever, so you have to mint, so it's a, that needs, this barrier needs to be gone until we can say that this is something going to become very big. At the moment, it's a, it's a game for the community who are already in the blockchain space, I would say. But this is also why I think that free-to-play developers have an actually have an inherent advantage here uh, because they are used to, you know, optimizing for retention, optimizing for conversion, getting those things in place and actually have a player at some point so vested into the game that they actually want to start spending, uh, spending on the game. And um, I think people have been a bit too hesitant in thinking that, okay, there needs to be an upfront purchase if, if I will make a, a blockchain game. It can start out as a free-to-play game, but, but what if we would instead, again, utilize the best practices from free-to-play, a very similar onboarding experience, starting to, to play with the game and the assets. And we might look at the player minting the assets that they earn from the game as a new kind of a conversion event. And that's how we get them vested into the play to earn part of those games. But I think that hybrid model will become a lot more common um, this year. And, and if, 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 it's, if there's going to be a way to bring more mainstream use in the market, I think it's going to be through that kind of education. So mainly through, mainly through the games being super accessible. Uh, but obviously then also education about for education towards vested players to actually make that jump and convert themselves to NFT owners or, or, or token holders. Now with that, there's also the jump that developers have to make from being game developers to being sort of crypto literate and to really thinking about how, how they're going to mint, how they're going to handle player wallets, what blockchain they're going to use. How do we begin to make it an easier jump for developers? to go that direction as opposed to crypto developers who are trying to learn how to make games? Like what, what's the key to making it less frictionful and what sorts of tools and technologies, uh, especially developers here, have you seen that, that you've liked and that have kind of sort of smoothing the way? Uh, Tony? I'm not a developer. <laughs> well, you guys. Well, yeah, so it's, uh, we've always been um, focused on the user and, and Therefore, our developers are trying to make stuff that is super easy for them to do. So I'm going to give you an example. So the Doctor Who trading card game that we've got coming out, it's like Hearthstone or Magic the Gathering. We don't even mention the word NFT on the website. We don't even mention blockchain. We say, come onto the website, 
buy these cards and you own them and guess what you can trade them and you can buy these cards with a credit card and with paypal and if you've got crypto you can click on this and buy with crypto it's it the so, so the developers behind the scenes because it's on a side chain actually don't need that much blockchain experience we are we're, we're hybrid so it's not a true web3 blockchain game but that doesn't matter you can still you can do everything on the side chain it's owned it goes in your when you sign up you put in your email address and, and your your name and we create you an ethereum wallet without you even knowing that's that's now your account you buy the nfts with a credit card they go into your account if you want to take them to OpenSea or take them to an external wallet that's the point where you need from the user's point of view maybe some crypto knowledge because you have a drop down that says do you want to use binance smart chain ethereum mainnet polygon solana you choose the chain depending on the gas fees and go withdraw and off it goes to an external wallet it's super easy and that's what we want to do and 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 it, it didn't take a huge amount of blockchain skill to do that i don't think jerry sorry sorry uh, from a developer point of view i think the new thing uh, for us would be to thinking about the tokenomics uh, and uh, the whole economy uh, we have uh, similar problems like uh, for example uh, central banks might have is there an inflation uh, in in the game uh, and uh, what happens if uh, if someone amasses a huge fortune in the middle ages the king just went there and killed them all but we can't do that for the players and and uh, also th that kind of things uh, that we haven't actually experienced in mobile games for are example. you trying to um skill up in house at that with people who come from games or are you trying to hire people who've actually created player economies actually oh, both. blockchain i guess actually it's, both it's very hard. there aren't many of them out there right yeah. I, I think games developers in reality won't really need to interact with blockchains when they work at scale it's, it's like plumbing for the internet it's infrastructure and if you look at like public key cryptography which is what underpins most uh, blockchains that's existed since the early 90s if not before and it never went mainstream why because it's a total pain to use no one wants to do it uh, so in reality i believe most services will be custodial games developers will that means that someone else is looking after the assets for on behalf of the developer and i think this is critical to understand because in these things have financial value and if you're custodying something of value on behalf of a gamer you're like a bank you need to be regulated there are licenses associated with that I don't think games developers want to become, you know, registered payment services providers. I believe they will lean on custodians. So that's all a bit of a shill for Zebedee. Apologies, but I, I, I really do think that uh, <laughs> games developers don't want to do that, and they won't touch the blockchain. And maybe there's also one other thing: um, if the game is on blockchain, uh, on on chain, the whole game, every time you make an update, you have to tell the users to uh, swap to a new wallet. You know, so it's also like. So you all already almost need a complete, a complete game. So it's not in free to play, you can iterate, you can change things, balance, add new content constantly, because every time you do it, then they have to, you know, it's a hustle on the side of the players. Correct me if I'm wrong. So how do we um, encourage community in an industry built around sort of speculation and selling? How do, we, how do we get people to stick around and become a vibrant community like we've traditionally had in video games when part of the business is built around secondary sales and reselling your stuff? Who wants to take that? Anton? Mm, I'm gonna throw a guess here, but um, uh, how I would look at it is, is um, obviously look at the core, kind of the core cohort of users that you have. Uh, I think if you wanna create anything sustainable, that experience has to be tailored to those people, the speculators may come and go a bit depending on on how your how your token is doing on crypto Twitter and how much it's being it, it's being talked about. Uh, but um, but there again, I think the ones that will find sustainable communities and not discords filled with bots and 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 um, endless copies of Telegram groups when when there's a new token sale up 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 and coming uh, is that you can actually attract the players to the Discord. Most of these are from the aforementioned category, I would say currently, when I've been taking a closer look at the amount of members versus the activity. Uh, but then again, I think that will normalize. And it's, I mean, it's, it's back to first principles from that perspective. Anyone else having done? No? I, I think uh, just trust, fun, and entertainment. That's games, that's what games are. 
when there's a financial component, you need to you need the players' trust. So abuse of that trust is not going to build a community. If uh, if what you're marketing to your users is just give us your money, that's that's not fun. No one wants that. That's that's not entertainment. You're asking you're asking that for them to actually transact with you. So build something fun and entertaining, and then the value will come, as will the community. So two sides to blockchain, right? Owning your stuff, never having to rent your stuff again, um, super interesting. And then there's the tokenomics. Um, how important do you think it is to figure out for a game developer tokenomics early on, or is it wiser to wait to build a community first? Um, how do you feel about sort of what's been going on in terms of these early tokenomics plays where they're launching a token before they have any content? Um, Yari? Uh, I would say that the community probably expects that you have a pretty good idea of the tokenomics uh, or what, what, why would they come there in the first place? It's very important that you have a roadmap. Um, the, the big difference between blockchain gamers and traditional gamers is that the blockchain gamers are a very loud community within the Discord channels that you run for those games. And trust is so important, you're absolutely right. If, you, if, you, if something goes wrong or there isn't a roadmap or you, you divert, you can kill that community overnight. Everyone will just leave. And, and, and that's what I found really fascinating about the difference between traditional games and, and blockchain games is, is, is the passion that comes with some of these. But you do need to, you know, you need to show when it comes to token economics or just having a token at the beginning. It's, it, for me, it's not really about is the token going to rise? I mean, there will be speculators, there will be people that will look at that and maybe it's, it's a, just a bet on the token. It's about the journey. And, and, the, and if it's fun and there's liquidity and people are, are, are using that token within the game and there's a roadmap of stuff going on that will continue, then it will, it will go up in its own accord. What do you think, Anson? How important is tokenomics early on in the life of a blockchain game? Um, it is early, but I would still kind of keep st stick to the free-to-play mindset of iterating and and changing if needed. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's an either-or, and I don't I don't think it's a either token token design first or game first. I think it's a, obviously it's it should be symbiotic. I say it should make the token design should make sense for the game, and the the game should make sense for the uh, for the token design. If I would have to guess. Uh, which one of the, if, if we look at them like two, two different categories, if I would have to guess which one's going to get commoditized faster, is it the ability uh, and the talent to create fun and engaging core loops uh, and, 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 and metagames for a game? Or is it kind of creating a, a cookie cutter token design? My guess would be that the latter will be commoditized first. Uh, and uh, But then again, we, we, we don't know. But again, trying to just emphasize that I think here again is from a first principle approach, first principles approach that the game needs to be fun. Uh, it doesn't, it, it's irrelevant to think that is the game fun on its own without the token design because the token design is an inherent part of that game as well. But as a package, it needs to be. So yes, it, it is important, but, but again, it has to make sense with the game. It cannot just only make sense of its own. I mean, you can probably attract a lot of crypto only investors. They tend to just, make sure that the tokenomics may, or the token design makes sense. But um, if we're looking to build sustainable games and sustainable game economies, they, they go hand in hand. What do you think, Ben, especially going back to your securities background and the sort of risks of a game developer launching tokens? Uh, I'd ask a question the other way around. Uh, if you can do it with a stable coin, why wouldn't you? Are we rushing into launching tokens when there are other options? Yeah. Yeah. And I've, no, I've yet to hear a good answer for that beyond number go up. So let's talk about DAOs, because that's gotten very popular. Uh, what role do you think DAOs play in, in, in uh, game communities within blockchain? And how relevant is it to game developers to be looking at how to, well, first, what's a DAO, somebody? And how do we use that to encourage sort of community within games? Who wants to explain DAOs? Anton? <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll give my take, because I have a very strong opinion on this. Um, but. Um, so everybody has heard decentralized autonomous organization. It doesn't mean much, but um, at the end of the day, I, I think they're just the next evolution of, uh, of a typical limited company or any other kind of typical corporate structure. 
a limited company is at the end of the day just uh, now I'm getting a bit philosophical here but but the, a limited company at the end of the day is also just a set of contracts it's a shareholders agreement between the shareholders it's employment agreements with their with their employees and just partnership agreements with their clients it's essentially only a, a contract of agreements now a DAO is also a contract of smart contracts if I have a, if I put if I have a certain if I make a certain input to that set of smart contracts I get a certain reward based on the rules of those contracts and it's essentially the same thing I would view DAOs as Let's say if I have a LLC here in, I don't know what the typical limited company structure in England is, but it's, let's say it's, it's registered in the Registry of England and Wales. But a DAO, how I would look at that, it's an internet native company that is registered in Ethereum, which is a jurisdiction of its own, but it's untouched by sort of physical jurisdictions. Uh, but again, it's a way for, it's a new way for people to coordinate mainly around economic or activity that has an economic component, how I would look at it. But essentially, we're looking at the next phase of what companies are going to look like. And how relevant do you guys think that is for game developers to be looking at in terms of where they're going with their communities and decentralization? Well, if I continue, I think it's a way to, let's say, we put, if we put our game economy on chain and uh, we introduce a governance token to govern that set of smart contracts, uh, then again, that that's the same thing as when we're talking about treasuries for these games. They're, they're essentially DAOs that, if decided by the smart contracts and the game developer, they get a small fee of the revenue that is being generated by the game or the secondary market activity. And then it's a way for, again, we, we're coming back to, to my comparison to companies, but there again, and I agree with, with Ben on the, on the point that, that sort of, I don't think you should be doing arbitrary tokens to act as medium of exchange in your game because it just adds unnecessary friction and it's, it's more of a number go up play. Uh, whereas, um, why wouldn't you just use a stable coin? I do think that well-designed tokens, and if we look at the, many of the decentralized finance protocols and Ethereum and how those tokens are starting to take shape, is that they act more as of shares in those protocols. You have, and, and, but now we go to the risky waters that, hey, if it, if it walks like a duck, if it talks like a duck, it's probably a duck. And the same, <laughs> the same goes for securities as well. Um, but, but going back to games and running on-chain treasuries and having a treasury token to those, it's more about, again, giving, giving voting power to what, to what to be doing with those. Now, in the beginning, I don't think there's a lot of stuff these DAOs can be enforcing on-chain, on so they're very dependent on, for example, if you have players voting for what the next live event in your game is, you're still reliant on that game developer who initially launched that treasury to actually sort of execute that. So we're a long way still from actual on-chain governance within <laughs> games. Uh, but all in all, it's, it should be a way for a more tangible way for players to interact with with the game that they enjoy. Tony, Yari, have you guys looked at that for your communities at all? Ah, no, I mean, have you have you been looking at it at all as a company? Is that something of interest? <laughs> um, yes, I mean, it, I, I think DAOs are fantastic. I mean, it's taking it, it's it's taking centralized to decentralized. You know, it's not having a, a shareholder. <laughs> it's perfectly put. You know, having, it, your, having your your users as shareholders. Yeah. yeah. Well, it but it's a collection of people agreeing on something you know, there's not one person going you're going to get this you know, it's it's the it's the community all agreeing so no i think it's a fantastic way the risk is can you know can we manage by community and you know most of the DAOs are saying it's hard to get more than five percent of people to vote um so it, it certainly feels a, there's a real challenge in taking that from you know the idealism to something where things function and this is again something where i think we're again going to make a full full u-turn again or kind of a full 360 uh, is that again now we've gone into proof of stake models where it's intended that if you're a token holder you're going to participate in voting etc but for most people just don't care and uh, some of these layer ones or layer twos have already introduced delegated proof of stake where similar to a democracy you give your voting rights to someone else who is more active in that system so Again, we're just taking a full turn with, with a lot of obfuscation with terms, but we're just mimicking previous activity in a much more efficient way on the long term. So let's switch here and talk a bit about Apple and the consoles. And you know, there are a lot of these games are on the web, like Axie, you know, partly because you know, no one's quite sure how Apple's gonna react to this stuff yet. And um, Sony, I think has one game in development that they've announced. Um, I haven't seen anything from Nintendo or Microsoft yet. What are thoughts on what it's going to take to get more of these platforms as viable places for blockchain games? More users for apps outside of platforms. 
uh, and become big enough for them to ignore you. I'm going to let someone else talk as well, because otherwise... <laughs> you, you can get these games on the App Store. It's about what your mechanics are. So all, every game on our platform is available in the App Store. Apple, Apple doesn't have a problem, Apple doesn't have a problem with uh, Bitcoin because it's regulated, with us because we're regulated. Like that's, that's part of it. The, one of the questions they have, and we speak to them, is that the concerns are around like, who's buying these and who are you selling to? Is, it, is this kids? And you, know, you need to have answers to those questions. You can't just wave it away. Uh, and I think that becomes even more important with things like governance tokens, where you know these these are companies, and uh, the SEC just fined BlockFi uh, yesterday a hundred million dollars for issuing securities without a license with their lending product. And I think games developers need to think about this as they're launching their products. Can you really handle a fifty million dollar fine from the SEC, even if you had the best intentions? Like I, I don't think that's ground that developers want to walk into. So just have a conversation with the App Store. The guidelines are pretty clear and work within the framework and you can release on these on these platforms. You looked at the consoles as well or just uh, just Apple? Our technology will work with consoles, but we're not going to uh, rub Microsoft or Sony the wrong way. We'll, we'll <laughs> come to that when we're at the right scale. Do you think it's going to take, um, you know, publishers, we, we talked about this earlier, are very timid and pulling back every time they announce. It just seems to be another step back. Um, do you think that the industry sort of at large needs to have more of a position on this and take more of a sort of a direct role in how we think about these things and talking to Apple and talking to the console companies. What, what are your thoughts on how as an industry we can move forward? It's going to be the gamers. You know, it's going to be those gamers wanting to play a game where they own the assets. Why go here and lose, uh, spend all my money and the game goes bust and I've lost everything? Well, I can go here and spend money, take the stuff out, sell it, trade it. I'm going to go here, and it will be the gamers that, that will start to make the games developers and publishers having, have to move. Should we take some questions, anyone? Shall we open it up? Hello. Hello. Uh, thanks. This was really insightful chat. Excuse me, I uh, appreciate the conversation. I kind of want to come back to something that was talked about um, about halfway through where you were talking about kind of custodial and non-custodial and this idea of, I guess, more centralization. And the end result of a lot of that is that we also get like marketplace fracturization. And I think for a lot of people, the idea of NFTs has a sense of ubiquity to it. And the more we go down to kind of centralization providers such as Venly and Forte and that kind of thing, the more fractured that economy becomes, and actually the idea of what it means to own an NFT is less ubiquitous. So I'm kind of curious as to how you see those philosophies playing at odds with each other, and where you think the future might be in the next few years. Yeah, my favorite expression at the moment is I'm Web3 till I'm not, and I'm seeing a lot of that out there from people who are supposedly decentralized. So um, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about that. Um, don't know if you have a particular person, but who, who uh, would like to address? I mean, ben? one yeah, one comment I'd make is I think that, like privacy on the internet, the truth is is that a lot of users just don't care, and you've got to decide where decentralization is important. Uh, I don't think if you're running a company that you need to be too concerned about decentralization. I think if you're very ideologically aligned with that, then you should go pursue it, and free open source software exists to get hold of it. Um, but mo you know, this audience and most of us are just building games, and those you know don't necessarily need to be a completely 100% measurably decentralized. I mean, ultimately, you're a company trying to make money and your users are just trying to have fun playing games. But yeah, um, I guess the internet was meant to be kind of decentralized and email people were meant to run their own email servers, but in order to reduce the friction, we ended up with ISPs and Gmail. Do you think there is a danger of the same thing having to the so-called decentralized blockchain gaming? Or like, does it matter? Like, How decentralized sh do these things need to be? But maybe you already answered that with the, <laughs> with the previous uh, fellow. Well, if, if um, everything happens according to Ben's wishes, we'll be all doing our Bitcoin transactions through Zebedee. <laughs> but Bitcoin itself will still be decentralized. That's the critical piece. I guess just to, to expand on it a little bit, not quite the same question, but what about interoperability? Um, because lots of people are building on lots of different blockchains and they're new ones all the time. 
Um, how important is it that we think about bringing things between blockchains, you know, be it, be it bridging or otherwise? Um, how important do you think that is? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it's important to unlock the full potential that, as, as said, all products we're going to use are more or less going to be on the same canvas, hopefully, or for everything that it makes sense. Uh, and um, in an ideal world, it reduces friction when moving from product to product. Cool. I think we've overrun. Sorry about That's that. Fine. Thanks, That's everybody. Fine. I hope that was insightful. Thank you.